Hi, and good afternoon. My name is Stacey Steele, and I am the Director of Marketing and Communications at Charity Navigator. Um, we are so happy to have you all here this, this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, today's webinar um, is, uh, is uh, being held in conjunction with Free Will. Um, we are going to be covering something that we hope will be very informative and uh, for those of you that are online and um, and this is your first foray into looking at planned giving, uh, this should be quite interesting for you. So today we're talking about long-term charitable support and leaving a legacy, why gifts and wills are so important. Um, the webinar will be recorded, so um, have no fear. What will happen is uh, within 24 hours after the conclusion of the live broadcast, you will receive a copy of um, the recording. Um, if you happen to be on the recording and you have to jump off, no fear, uh, you will still get a copy of the recording. Um, I will encourage you to put in your um, any questions you may have for our panelists today um, in the question area of uh, the webinar platform. So you should see it uh, somewhere on your screen, depending on what you're looking at, perhaps on your right, uh, you can add your questions there. We will have a Q&A towards the end of the presentation. Um, I will just make a disclaimer that uh, what we are presenting today does not constitute legal advice. We would suggest that if you have any questions that are specific and unique to your situation, that you consult with your legal advisor, your attorney, your financial advisor, your trusts and estates advisor, or someone else who you trust um, that can um, help to um, answer your questions. And with that said, we are very honored today to have as our guest, um, Patrick Smith, who is the co-founder and co-CEO of Free Will, as well as our major gifts officer, our charity navigator, Grace Dowd. And with that, Grace, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. As Stacey mentioned, I'm Grace Dow, the Major Gifts Officer here. Uh, some of you may be familiar with what we do here at Charity Navigator, but for those of you who are new to us, we were founded by Pat and Marion Dugan 20 years ago with the novel concept that there should be a guide for intelligent giving. The Dugans envisioned an unbiased and transparent source of information that would assist givers with every type of charitable interest in finding a charity to support. 20 years in, we're about, we're the world's largest and most utilized independent nonprofit evaluator. And we're the source, valuable resource to about 11 million folks a year. Our platform provides donors of all sizes with free access to data, tools, and resources to guide philanthropic decision-making using a, a number of key components. Our ratings are our bread and butter. We evaluate nonprofits based on four domains, finance and accountability, impact and results, culture and community, and leadership and adaptability. And to date, we've rated nearly 200,000 nonprofits. Our advisories are reported or confirmed misconduct at nonprofits across the country. And about at any given time, we have about 500 advisories on our site. Our hot topics our expertly curated lists of nonprofits aligned with calendared events like uh, Pride Month um, and emergency disaster relief and recovery, like our recent, um, the recent struggles in Ukraine. Our giving basket enables donors to support multiple organizations all in one convenient checkout. And thus far, we have funneled over $171 million to nonprofits doing good across the world. Be mute briefly. So thanks so much, Grace. We'll hand it back to you in a second. Um, but delighted to introduce myself. I'm lucky to be one of two co-founders of Free Will alongside my wonderful co-founder Jenny, pictured here. And together we feel deeply fortunate to be able to work alongside a whole Free Will team of uh, 200 plus folks, generated more than six million dollars in charitable gifts, helped more than 600,000 people with their estate plans. Um, and here we are. Uh, pictured at a recent team retreat where actually many of us met for the first time. So it was really, really delightful. 
And at its core, what we try to do is we help to build technology to help you make a big impact on the people and causes you love. And so our whole team focuses on that. And I'll share a bit more about that later. Um, but first, handing it back to Grace to share a little bit more about what Charity Navigators learned about why people give. Yeah, we've learned a lot after 20 years. Um, Charity Navigator has been focused on supporting donors find organizations um, and feel good about how our dollars are spent. And we therefore see a lot of reasons why people give, either out of a sense of personal responsibility, um, the desire to contribute to the greater good, sometimes it's tax benefits, often it's a friend posting something on social media or an organization that someone volunteers with. Um, often people donate in response to current crises, like our hot topics um, or current events, um, but also transitions of life, like marriage, birthday, retirement, coming into new wealth, or when a loved one passes. But no matter the reason that you choose to give, we want to help you give with your heart and your head. So once you've determined what charities you're most passionate about, there are a lot of ways to increase your impact long-term for you and the nonprofit that you support, either with their budgeting or strategic planning or their future initiatives. Donating via stocks, IRA disbursements, et cetera, can all be crucial in increasing your impact on your own assets and the nonprofits. But again, I'm gonna clarify, please be sure to be, teach, speak with a tax professional or someone who's knowledgeable of your situation or experience to determine which of these options works best for you. But either way, way, it's helpful to know that these options allow you to invest more in the charities that you love without affecting your everyday expenses and are one of many ways. This is not an exhaustive list, of course. But now I'm really excited to focus on one key long-term and impactful giving method, planned giving, or how to utilize your estate planning or will creation to create a charitable legacy. Patrick and Free Will are the true experts and they're really eager to share a lot more about the importance of having a will. Great, thanks so much, Grace. Um, and that brings us to our goals for today, which is really two things. Uh, the first is to help you think about how you might create a free estate plan or do your own estate planning. What are some of the big questions to ask? And the second is to share a little bit more about what other people do uh, in terms of having a much bigger impact on the charitable causes they love through this, this type of giving as well. So we're gonna talk about a few different topics and, and stick with me, but feel free to type in questions in the chat and we'll get to those at the end as well. So first thing to know is why is creating a will even important and what should you might, what might you wanna consider? Uh, first things to know is that everybody really needs an estate plan. And, and yet nearly 70% of Americans don't have a will. Um, they leave their financial decisions and their personal decisions up to the court, up to local state laws, so maybe one thing I would encourage you to do at the end of this is think about some of the other people in your life that might be in this position and share this with them. Um, on the converse, having an up-to-date will protects your loved ones from being burdened, from being confused, and making sure that they can actually honor your wishes. Identifying things like it shows an ex state executor, prevents a public trustee from being appointed, that's really important. And the probate process can be slow and arduous and painful without a will, it becomes more complicated the larger and more complex the estate. And this is really a moment where you want things to be as easy as possible for your family and loved ones. So we'll go step by step through a couple of the really big things that a will touches because it's not just, it's not just who gets what. Um, first thing to know is let's make sure the children are protected. Um, if you are a parent and the child's other parent survives you, they will usually get custody. Um, but a lot of folks in a will will have a guardian for children. That guardian is responsible for children's daily needs, like housing and healthcare and education. Uh, if no guardian is named, a court is gonna choose, and that's not what you want. A couple things to think about when you pick a guardian. One, religious preferences, right? Is there a religion that you want the children raised in? Let's make sure the guardians have that as well. Physical ability, is someone actually just physically up for caring for a young child? Emotional health, financial stability, and things like geography. It's really important to you that they're, that they're close to their grandparents, your parents. Think about a custodian that might be, um, or a guardian that might be quite close uh, geographically towards them. Uh, big thing to know here is please don't make this a surprise. So if, if you're gonna name somebody a guardian in your will, make sure you have a conversation about that before it happens. 
you'd be surprised how often it doesn't. And that's really big news to someone, uh, as you might expect. Um, in a similar vein, think about your pets. And a lot of people use their state plan to take care of their pets. Legally, you cannot leave anything to your dog or your cat. The federal government, state governments do not see them as a person, uh, regardless of how much you love them. But you can leave your pet to someone to make sure that the pet is looked after. You can also leave a specific amount to your pet guardian for the pet's care. And so this is typically what folks do who are looking out for their pets. You might even have a trust pay out a specific amount per month or year of the pet's lifetime. And so that's another big avenue that people think about. So many of you, uh, stats, you know, stats show about half of you might have pets at home. And, um, and so that'll be really important to you. Third thing to think about is who's gonna manage the estate. And, uh, and that person is called the executor. The executor of a will or trust is broadly responsible for carrying out your wishes. Things that we want to consider as we pick an executor. Do they have the time to do it? Are they going to be intimidated by dealing with lawyers or courts or financial advisors, or are they really comfortable in that environment? Do they have the emotional quotient to deal with loved ones and share uh, the wishes of the will? If you don't have an executor, your spouse will typically be asked to take this role, followed by your oldest child if applicable, but it's really important to have this in your own, in your own plan. Um, other things to note here is don't make that a surprise either, right? So make sure you have a conversation with that person. The next big thing to think about is who gets the stuff, right? There are tons of stories of artists, of businessmen, of musicians, of athletes, and others who passed away without a will. We hear about this all the time. And then often what happens is these estates languish in court for years and are worth tens of millions of dollars, but maybe worth a lot less because of all the legal fees associated with it. So that's a really big thing. Couple things to think about when we think about who gets the stuff. You might choose to give specific assets to specific people. Alternatively, you can choose to have everything liquidated and then divide the funds by percentages. For example, 25% to child A, 25% child B, 35% to a grandchild, 15% to a charity, things like that. If there, if, is there anyone that you specifically don't want to receive anything because of you know, some happenstance? You want to name that. Um, really important. Um, lots of financial stuff, again, on the stuff category, is held in what are called non-probate assets. And this is really important. It's what are called payable on death or transfer on death clauses. These pass outside of your will and include things like retirement accounts, life insurance policies, investment accounts, etc. Confusing probate and non-probate assets is probably the number one most common mistake. And so it's something we really want to be thoughtful about. So that's on the stuff. A couple notes on digital assets, which are increasingly important over the last decade. So many people now choose to name a digital executor to manage or close email, social media accounts. This person also manages all files, videos, photos of your digital devices. Um, and this is a non-legal document, right? So this is an auxiliary role that accompanies your will, with specific instructions and passwords, et cetera. And so that's really, really important as well, given how much of family heirlooms that used to be in photo albums now may live online. Um, and then one more thing to think about is protecting the causes you love. So many, many people include gifts to their favorite nonprofits in their will. A common theme here is people leaving a percentage of the total estate rather than a specific cash amount. Um, the reason for that, by the way, before we get to the next piece, is it really helps sort of grow or shrink the gift you know, based on your own estate. And it really is a much more in line with your intended wishes than a cash amount that we might not update uh, for enough time. One thing to know is that notifying the charity of this gift intention makes their lives a lot easier, their lives a lot easier. Um, and so uh, we'll talk more about charitable giving at the end, but I did want to note that. So when you start to have these conversations, let's talk about what to discuss with your loved ones. And the biggest risk uh, in this is confusion not conflict. So having a clear articulate estate plan prevents a ton of fighting after an unexpected loss. Um, and what's happening is that we're seeing this big shift. 20 years ago, these conversations didn't happen that much, but increasingly people are choosing to talk about these decisions as a family in order to avoid unnecessary conflict. Um, as I mentioned, the big risk isn't conflict though, it's confusion. You wanna make sure that key parties know where your plan is and the values and logic behind your decisions. This makes it much easier to carry out your wishes. Um, one thing that a lot of people ask is, how do I get my parents to talk about this, right? A lot of you all might be helping uh, older parents with estate planning or nudging them along the way. 
Now, polling shows that the overwhelming majority of millennials have never spoken to their parents about estate planning. And broaching the topic can be a bit scary. So the, the big tip that we offer is frame it in advice or sharing. Rather than say, did you make a will? Where's your will? You could say something like, I'm making a will for the first time. How did you all pick an executor? In case anything happens, I want you, you all to know where my plans are. How did you decide what safe place to use? And this kind of conversation tends to be very well received and really opens the door for some more thoughtful dialogue. Other things to think about is considering funeral wishes. So if having a funeral or religious ceremony is important to you, um, are specific songs or readings meaningful? Is there someone you'd like to speak? Is there someone you'd like to not speak? Do you have an uncle who famously goes on you know, 30 minute rants? Maybe we'll make sure that that's not part of the ceremony. Um, do you have wishes about how you'd be buried? Right? For some of you, that might be religious. Uh, for some of you, it might just be personal preference. Um, a lot of people will choose to articulate a charity who's receiving donations in lieu of flowers. And then you know, one big question is, what feeling do you want people to have at the event? And culturally, this can be very, very different. And so worth naming that as well. Quick reminder, um, creating a will is a profoundly personal exercise, but it actually doesn't have to be that time consuming or that expensive. Um, so make sure to take care of yourself and your loved ones throughout the process. Uh, the free will tool allows you to start the process and return to finish at any time or make changes at any time, right? A lot of people don't do estate planning because they're afraid that it's so final, but actually you can do it and we commonly encourage folks to update it every five years or so. So now uh, that's a little bit about why make an estate plan. And hopefully we're able to uh, share that clearly and talk about some of the really big effects. Now I'm going to talk through uh, what other people are doing around legacy giving. And, and that may inform some of your own giving preferences given the nature of our conversation. So what's happening right now? I mean, we are at a really interesting moment because the baby boomer generation is the largest and wealthiest in the history of the United States. So over the next 25 years, up to almost $70 trillion will be passed on. This is from about 45 million US households. And what we call the great wealth transfer is probably the largest transfer of wealth in human history. And by the way, we think of it, it's actually the most important moment for philanthropy that's ever existed. So a lot of this money is going to Gen X and millennial and Gen Z younger children, right? These will be the primary recipients of the transfer. So by 2030, millennials will have actually five times as much wealth collectively as they have today. Um, boomers tended to have fewer children than their parents did. So inheritance tend to be more concentrated per child. And so that's part of that wealth transfer across the board. But trillions of dollars are also expected to pass to charity between now and about 2061, which feels like quite a long ways off. When we think about this, uh, it's important to know because bequests tend to have a transformational impact to an even greater degree than any other potential type of giving. Charitable gifts and wills make a huge impact on causes uh, that you love and no cost to you today. Leaving a portion of your estate, estate excuse me, helps these organizations fuel their mission for years and years and decades and decades to come. Remembering charities alongside your family member also creates this really meaning, meaningful legacy for the groups you support in your life is often celebrated by family members. Um, but net net, these are going to be potentially the largest, most impactful gift that you or someone you know ever makes. One thing that we're seeing is that Americans are getting more charitable. And so we have a lot of research. Free Will has done about 600,000 estate plans over the years. And from, from June 2020 to May 21, we saw 19% of folks on the platform include a charitable gift. This is a 6% jump from previous year, which is really outstanding. 18% um, of folks with estate plans under $100,000 still give to charity, so it's really open to all sorts of estates. Um, $41,000 is the average gift value, and many people choose to have multiple gifts, right? So that 41,000 is often multiplied by three in terms of giving to various places. Um, about two thirds of legacy donors share their confirmation with their chosen charities. This allows them to thank you, which is really exciting, often invite you to events, um, hear a lot more about the work that's being done and, and pretty exciting. And actually bequest, many people don't know this, but it's almost $50 billion a year already. So it's really powering a lot of the causes you love and a lot of the impact you love already, thanks to so many uh, really thoughtful and generous people. I mentioned this great wealth transfer, and what you're seeing is this money is gonna be going in a bunch of directions. 
Some of it's going to other baby boomers, some of it's going to Gen X, some of it's going to millennials, and a lot of it's going to charity. So these decisions tend to be really important because they're going to shape the future of, of not just you know, the nonprofit landscape, but really the United States and the world. A couple other things we've seen, older individuals tend to give fewer but larger gifts. So younger people make fewer estate plans, but 25% of those under 25 include a gift to charity compared to only 15% of those over 65. Some interesting things, but the value of gifts from donors age 65 plus are three times larger. People over 65 account for only about 17% of the US population, give nearly 40% of all charitable bequest dollars on the platform. Interestingly, from a gender lens, um, we see nearly 60% of estate plans that are made by women. Uh, really interesting, women tend to be a little bit better at planning ahead. Uh, they're more charitable. Um, their gifts tend to be a little bit smaller on average. And 2021 was the first year in our data set when women gave a greater share of all bequest dollars than men. Um, we'll note that we, we measure uh, non-binary folks and their behavior tend to be very generous, um, but that population is very small in our data set, so there's still some learnings to do there. Um, other things we're seeing uh, that folks with, uh, basically folks who don't have children for the most part, tend to leave more gifts, um, for potentially obvious reasons. Um, people without immediate family are twice as likely to leave a gift than those with a spouse or children. And this can be a, a profound way to make a lasting mark. And so a lot of people choose that route as well. Um, pet owners, we talked about uh, some of you pet owners earlier, and this data really surprised us. People that included a pet in their estate plan are 70% more likely to make a legacy gift. And so that was cool to see. Um, the value of their gift was about a little bit lower on average, but more people are giving. Um, so a lot of interesting data there. And you know, really lucky to be here and talking about this now because August actually tends to be uh, what's called National Make a Will Month, celebrated by hundreds and hundreds of charities and tens of thousands of people. So what Make a Will Month is is it's a campaign designed to close the legacy gap for the two-thirds of Americans without an up-to-date will. Um, during last August, nearly 30,000 new estate plans were created to spread thousands and thousands of families, which was wonderful. It's also one of the highest energy moments for planned giving, and so nearly half a billion dollars was committed to charity uh, in August last year, and that was really wonderful to see. Um, Free Will, which is now the number one estate planning tool in the United States, uh, which we're really delighted to have. Um, you can go to freewill.com. It's easy to use. It allows you to save money creating a plan. It takes you step by step through the process in 30 minutes or less, which is really uh, the right amount of time for some folks. And you can use the tool from the comfort of your own home with your family and things like that. In interviews, many of the folks that we've talked to said they wrote their will with family members around dining room tables, right? So that tends to be a thoughtful conversation and a really way to actually navigate that conversation because you're guided through specific questions. Um, one of the reviews that I won't read in its entirety just said it was a life-changing product. And I think we've had 100,000 reviews so far or something similar. Um, this website makes it incredibly easy, highly recommended, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, one other thing to note before I want to take action just to double down on what Grace said is that this is a really great tool even for folks with more complicated estate plans. And so if you've got property overseas, if you have complicated family situations, things like that, um, let's see if I can restart my video that my briefly froze. Um, then you can actually use all the tools and, and create what we call documented wishes. And that way you have all your affairs in order before you bring it to an attorney. So that's also a great option as well. I just wanted to name that as well. So we're in Make a Will Month. Um, and before I get to questions, we wanted to share this with you. Um, if you are ready to take action, and ready to take action doesn't mean go from zero to 90 right now, but you really want to click on this link and I think we can hopefully share it in the chat. Um, it's freewill.com slash charity navigator, which is a partnership that we've been able to uh, create together. And this will help you uh, give to any one of uh, the charities you love, including Charity Navigator, who we personally love and, and you may as well. And so um, we'll share this with you and we'll share this. Uh, there's a QR code you can use. We'll also share the link after the fact. But we just want to let you know that it's much easier to start than you might have thought and that a lot of folks are starting this month and, and we'd encourage you to be one of them. Um, when you get through the tools, as you can see at this top here, there's a lot of different categories. Um, but you're able, if you'd like to, to uh, give to Charity Navigator, give to any nonprofit in the, uh, that you like. And so you're, you put in all the relevant information there. 
and then your executor will make sure that that gift happens, which is really exciting. Um, a lot of people choose to leave percentages, as I mentioned early, it tends to be a lot cleaner for the whole estate. Um, you can also, as I mentioned, enter in, you know, one of, uh, you know, literally, I guess there must be 2 million nonprofits in the US right now, so any of those as well. Um, so what might you do next? Well, let's get started at freewill.com slash charity navigator. We'd really encourage you to at least start today. And you can always change your plans. You can always finish them later. Um, but taking that first step allows you to see that maybe this isn't as, as challenging as I thought it was. Um, we also encourage people to think of this less as a financial chore and more as a meaningful expression of your values. In fact, one of the most important ones you'll have. Um, so if you have any questions for Charity Navigator, um, Grace is your expert who can help you out there uh, with her email address there. And um, with that, we are going to move to questions. And so we'll welcome your questions and Grace and I will do our best uh, with another loving reminder that this is not legal advice. And so we'll caveat it there. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. That was uh, that was great. That was very, very informative. That was a lot of information that happened in a very short period of time. We do have some questions. Um, we look like we have about 30 minutes for questions. There have been a few that have come, come through in the chat. And uh, while I read some of the questions, I'll be checking the chat to see if there are others. So um, let's get started because I'd like to see if we can get through those that have already been posted. Um, so here's the first question. Um, and Patrick uh, and Grace, uh, you know, if you both decide that you want to answer the, the same questions or you want to bounce things off of each other, please feel free to do so. Um, first question, why is a will a better option than designating beneficiaries? Great question. So I can answer this and Grace, if you have anything to add, let me know. Um, we would not treat it as another option, right? You actually, you actually should be doing both. So if you have um, a retirement account, for instance, that's one of the, the most common assets that requires beneficiary designations. And so you really want to be having a will for the majority of your things and making sure that each of those have what we call beneficiary designations, which is just a fancy way of saying, um, who has access to this if something happens to you? So uh, don't think of it as two options. I think of it as both and. And actually, um, the free will tools have a component that help you with your beneficiary designations as well, because that's so important. And we have another question here um, that actually just popped up, and I want to get to it before I get to the other so that we don't lose track of this. Someone asked, could you reshare that giving USA statistic? I believe it's the statistic that we mentioned early on in the presentation. So if it's the statistic I recall, it's that, that nearly $50 billion was given last year in bequests. And we actually see this accelerating year over year, and likely to continue to rise at a pretty rapid clip. Um, so that's that's the stat from Giving USA. To give you an idea, that's about twice as much as all corporate giving and about two thirds of all foundation giving. So it's really considerable. Well, that's fantastic. Um, okay, here's a question. I am not sure that anyone in my immediate family will have the time to be my executor. Can I designate someone like an attorney? Uh, the short answer is yes. And so uh, for some folks, there may be fees associated with it, but you can certainly find um, an attorney. And for more complicated estates, this tends to be the norm. So great question for you. The next question, uh, how can you choose charities to leave gifts to in your will? You've mentioned about the freewill.com slash charity navigator, but is there um, information on nonprofits on charity navigator that we can review? I can answer that. Um, <laughs> yes, so um, Charity Navigator has information on all of the charities that are um, 501c3 nonprofits in the US. So on our website, you can find information and for some of them, a rating on all of those nonprofits. Um, and you can do a little bit of 
of looking at charities that you care about, deciding which ones that you might want to support in the long term or in the present. Um, and then using the link that we've talked about uh, or that is also shared, you can add nonprofits through the free will site or if you're doing it in any capacity, all you need is a little bit of information about the nonprofit that you want to support um, in order for that to be able to be um, executed to your um, wishes. So there's a lot of information available. Um, some charities have more than others, and it might be just a helpful note. Some charities have uh, a different name on our site than they do on their website due to just legal naming um, conventions. Um, but if it is a charity, if it is a 501c3, it's findable on our site. So you can look up that information, see if we evaluate it, and if so, there's information about um, how they're utilizing their finances, their accountability to their donors, um, their impact, if we've got a score on that, which is how effective they're being with their mission, um, and that sort of thing. So you can find the most impactful charities that fit the causes that you most care about. Thanks, Grace. Patrick, this is, this is a question for you. Okay. Why is free will free? Yeah, great question. <laughs> um, so free will is free because uh, what, when Jenny and I did a bunch of research out at Stanford, this is now six, seven years ago, we really did a lot of digging into why more of the US wasn't making bequests. And we have a very, very uh, generous population. And yet historically only about 4% of wills had a charitable gift in them. And that was pretty alarming to us. And so we, we did a lot of research and we dug in and we said, why is this happening? And it came down to two reasons. The first reason is that people don't like doing estate planning and they always, they always find a reason to put it off until tomorrow, right? So many people said things like, you know, I'll do it next year, but wait, I think I said that last year um, and things like that. And so we made it free to, to really cut down those barriers. The second reason, by the way, that, that charitable requests were so low is that no one was asking. And that actually, it turns out when you put charitable giving front and center in the process, some people say no, but a lot of people say yes. And what we realized is the choice wasn't, you know, it wasn't that people were making a yes or no decision, it's that, that no one was asking. And as you can probably imagine, estate planning puts a lot of things on your mind. And so charitable giving, even if it's important to you, might not be the number one thing if you're figuring out, you know, which guardian for your child or who gets your goldfish and things like that. Um, so that's what we did. And, and the way we are able to make it free was able to partner with charities like Charity Navigator and the Red Cross and the United Way and American Heart Association. And so that allows us to, to put a lot of work in and keep it free for all users. Um, and that's been delightful. And, and actually that's how it ended up being the number one estate planning tool in America. I think it overtook LegalZoom last year. So we're really proud of that. Thanks, Patrick. Um, this actually, this question goes back to a question that you've answered already, but I see that the person is probably trying to see if there are uh, perhaps more that you can say on this. Uh, they say, if I don't have an obvious family member or trusted friend to appoint as executor for my will, what are, what are other alternatives? Um, I guess I will also latch on to that, my own question, which is, you know, what's the, if you really don't have anyone at all to, to assign as an executor, uh, what generally, again, we're not providing legal advice on here and we're not tax advisors, but uh, what generally happens when someone dies without a will? What, you know, uh, we've heard the words probate, you know, what's that? And uh, what, what does that, what happens in, in, when it goes to probate court, if, if uh, you uh, uh, you pass away and things go to pro probate court. Yeah, great question. So uh, the first question is uh, just to reiterate: if you don't have an executor, um, you can go out and find an attorney to sign up for this. And so you can do some googling about you know legal executors in my area, and there there are folks that do this. Um, for those folks, there tend to be uh, fees that tend to, to correlate with percentages of the whole estate, right? So that's uh, that's where it might be. If you have a will but don't have an executor, usually the court will appoint one for you. 
And so they may ask you for, you know, they may first ask the spouse, eldest siblings, eldest kids, things like that. And if not, they will then appoint an attorney as well. Um, if you don't have a will, uh, things get tougher. I mean, first, you may end up spending a lot of time in court, or, or, or your loved ones may. Um, the second is that, that many states tend to have formulas for how things are divvied up, right? First to spouses, if no spouses, then children, if no children, then siblings, if no siblings, then parents, if no parents, then cousins, things like that that vary state by state. And so that's where you sort of in the movies, you know, you hear, oh, you know, my distant uncle died, left a huge fortune, and I was the only remaining relative, things like that, um, which tends not to happen as much in real life. Um, but that's that's sort of the origin of that. And so it's, you know, it's really tricky because then, you know, the state law and the state legislature potentially 45 years ago is making decisions for where everything goes. Uh, and that's not ideal. Um, and again, there will also be fees associated with that. So that can draw down the state, uh, which is not what you want as well. And while we are on still on this topic, Patrick, um, another related question. Don't know if you can answer this one, and I'm not sure if Grace has heard of this either. Uh, someone asked the question, are there organizations that act as will executors? And if yes, what are the disadvantages rather than nominating a friend or family member? So when they say organizations, I'm going to assume that they mean a nonprofit. Uh, not that I generally a, an organization. Yeah, not that I've heard of. So there's certainly again, you know, attorneys that do this for fees, um, but not that I know of. And I could be wrong, but but we haven't encountered that much. Um, so the upside, you know, there are also upsides of hiring a professional attorney to do this, and that they likely know a bit more uh, what they're doing, and it's unlikely to be their first rodeo. And so that's the upside. And the downside again is largely costs and you know you may lack a little bit of personal touch that that say your brother might might provide in terms of breaking news to family and and sort of helping folks navigate the process so um you know i think you'll figure out what works well for you and, and both of those are are good decisions i have an interesting question here um okay um, well, here's a general question. Can you share more about digital assets? What is that? Yeah, so think about things that have meaning that are digital, but may not have a clear dollar value associated with them. So a couple of examples, the pictures on your iPhone, right? The pictures in your Facebook profile, the emails that you've sent to family members over the years, right? These are all digital assets that are not, you know, quote unquote, valued by modern capitalism, but clearly have uh, intense value potentially to your family and your loved ones. And so, um, or you might say, you know, just delete it and never look, but that's still an action that needs to get taken. And so when we talk about digital assets, that's what we mean. It, it tends to be things with relatively high intrinsic value that, that may not have sort of tangible aspects to them. Um, but but you you want to be thoughtful about this, and and this is a relatively modern component of estate planning for obvious reasons. Um, it used to be you know, when my grandmother passed away a bunch of years ago, we sort of you know sifted through the photo albums and and took photos that everyone felt closest with. But that was part of the estate plan itself because it's it's a physical good. So um, it's a great question. Um, uh, another question. Uh, and again, I, I'm not sure if we can answer this one. Um, are you able to speak to charitable gift annuities as a way of giving as opposed to just estate planning? Yes. So I'll speak a little bit about this. And Grace, if there's anything you want to add, feel free. Um, for those of you, just 30 seconds on what charitable gift annuities are, is charitable gift annuities are a type of annuity, which means you pay a bunch of money up front or some money back every year, usually as long as you live. And so there are some tax benefits I won't get into right now about doing this. And then you get um, usually payments in the form of cash back monthly, quarterly, or annually, depending on the arrangement. And so there can be some benefits there. And then when you pass away, the remainder that has not been paid out um, goes to 
goes to the organization. And so some very large organizations do this because they can take the risk that you will live well beyond the annuity. But if you have dozens and dozens of these in aggregate, uh, they're likely to come out ahead. But it's an interesting avenue. It's a little bit more of competition for other types of giving types now because it's it's a big it's a big outlay at the moment, right? Potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars, and then you're getting uh, that as well. So annuities tend to be uh, somewhat popular investment vehicles, especially for older donors who are worried about outliving their retirement savings. Um, and charitable gift annuities are a spin on that. That's sort of halfway in between people that want an annuity and also want to be making a charitable gift. So really interesting. What we've seen is that that only the larger and more sophisticated charities tend to do this. And so your big time colleges, some of your very large museums, um, very large cultural institutions, uh, things like the Red Crosses of the world, uh, you're less likely to find a charitable gift annuity at your local dog shelter, for instance. Thanks, Patrick. Um, while I have you here, I do have a specific question about free will and access. A uh, person says, I live in California. Does free will offer the option of a revocable living trust? Yes. Uh, so the short answer is yes, particularly in California. Um, California is the one state in the country where revocable living trusts, also known as RLTs, become much more important. Um, and so if you're in California, you probably know that if you're not in California, it's not as much to worry about. But yes, you can make an, an RLT in California on free will. Um, and you were just talking about pets. We have a lot of, we at Charity Navigator are pet lovers, and we have a lot of donors that we are well aware of that love their pets and love their friends' pets. And so um, there are a couple of questions about pets here. You've mentioned about not leaving gifts to your pets. But what about people who care for your for your pets after you're gone? Uh, yes, that's exactly the right path to take. So you assign a pet guardian or so, which basically says I bequeath my dog Toto to this person. And then with that, I'm going to bequeath $10,000 for the care of Toto. Um, and so that's an option that you'll see. One other small thing uh, is that there are some nonprofits, and there are fewer of them, but they exist. Uh, that are animal shelters or, or generally pro-animal nonprofits who may uh, serve as a pet guardian, usually if it's accompanied by you know, a certain level of bequest. And so uh, just something to know if that's really important to you. You might want to check with some of your local animal shelters or SPCAs or things like that. And related to that question, uh, uh, related to pets, um, uh, pet trusts. What, for example, is considered a reasonable amount to put in a trust for a pet's benefit? Should Toto get 10,000 or should we kind of up that? That's a great question. I don't have a great answer for you. Um, so certainly worth some Googling. Um, one small story that I did hear about, this is not a free will, estate plan, but um, someone at, I think the Columbia plan giving team shared with me is that in New York, someone had bequeathed a cat uh, and a thousand dollars a month to take care of the cat. And then, you know, at 10, 12, 13 years on, the, um, some of the, the siblings of the deceased got a little suspicious because this cat had lived a very, very long time. And what they found is that the pet guardian had rotated through three cats as they each passed away and painted a white spot in a very particular area. So, um, just a little bit of more insight on pet guardianship. Make sure you're very clear on, uh, you know, that it's it's only for this pet. Um, but it, it's a great question. I don't have a good answer for you in terms of what the right amount is, and it's certainly worth a a, a search to to do it. And would love to hear what you find out. I guess we can also comment and say uh, when you're actually talking about your will with your um, those who you love, as well as perhaps uh, your tax professional professional or someone else um, talk about your pets be very very specific about what it what what it is that you need for your pet or pets um, long after you're gone or um, you know whether or not you wish to uh, as we had, uh, said earlier to donate to say um, pet related charities or animal related charities um, there are literally thousands of them out there. 
all of them you can find uh, if they are 501c3, you should be able to find a listing on charitynavigator.org. Um, as this person says, it, this is a, a very thoughtful question. I appreciated the tips for how to navigate conversations about wills and plan gifts with family. But from a nonprofit uh, perspective, and, and Patrick, please chime in also, um, do you have similar tips for how to approach this conversation with individuals who you think might want to provide a legacy gift to, um, whether it's Charity Navigator or any organization? Good question. Grace, do you have any tips you want to share? I I was going to say um, my my tips of have many of them have been learned from free will. Um, the the question is as asking if a nonprofit wants to approach an individual. Was that correct, Stacey? No. So um, the person um, is uh, they appreciate the conversations about tips about uh, planned giving, but they would like to share with another person who they feel uh, could benefit from uh, these tips. Um, how do you approach, you know, how do you kind of approach this conversation? Again, this is probably not the easiest conversation to have with individuals, friends, other family members. Um, and they're saying, uh, if you have this conversation, how, uh, you know, how do you talk about, you know, providing a legacy gift to organizations that they, that other person may um, admire, like, love. I'm. I honestly am a little confused about who we're trying to help get a um, a conversation going with. Um, so Patrick, if you have something better than this, jump in. But um, I I think a, a lot of the the conversations um, can feel really awkward and stressful. But really, it's all about kind of questions and it's if you shift exactly as Patrick said earlier if you shift the conversation to be about values and um, kind of the things that people care about I think it really makes it a lot easier to discuss right um, everybody this is really personal to people um, and I think most everybody would like the the assets that they've acquired in their life to go to the places that they really feel strongly about, whether that's friends, families, or charities. Um, and, and so initiating that with either sharing of what you're experiencing, what you've identified and cared about. I do think that I hear more people talking about what they're leaving to nonprofits, you know, vocalizing what they've what they've done makes a difference in um, reminding folks what's possible. Um, yeah, Patrick, do you have anything to share to that? I think that's right. Um, the only thing I would add is this is an element where something called social proof is really important, right? So whether you're a nonprofit talking to a donor, whether you're just a friend talking to another friend, you want to encourage some charitable giving, just say, hey, you know, one of the things we've learned recently is that a lot of people are making gifts this way. Is that something you've ever thought about? I know I'm thinking about it a little bit. And that's a very easy way to introduce the conversation than saying, Grace, you should make a will today. You should put a charitable gift in it. Like that's a very different environment than saying, Grace, you know, I, heard it, I just heard it's make a will month. I hadn't heard of that. Is that something that you have? I'm trying to figure it out with my spouse or whatever. Um, so uh, that's where it is. Um. I think that would answer the person's question. So I, I, I think uh, if I caught correctly, uh, really kind of framing the narrative to talk about values. Um, again, not an easy conversation to have. It's awkward and no one wants to talk about death and what happens when they're gone, but it's best to, to address this head on and so that those that you may leave behind including your pets are are taken care of and everybody's clear as to what your wishes are um someone did ask however can bequests be done after the death of someone who did not have a will i uh, know that's part of the reason it's really important to have a will so uh, again if you don't have a will it sort of goes into the, the algorithm of the state which can vary based on 
the state that we're in. Um, and so uh, is, you know, you may say, well, well, my mother, you know, cared deep, so deeply about this cause, volunteered four days a week for 20 years. Surely she would want X and, um, and that's just not how it works, right? It, the, the state so it doesn't sort of give, give the children power to figure out what they want to do. Now, if they inherit some money and want to donate it to that organization, that's certainly there, but, but not, from a, not from the estate itself. Okay. Um, this person, this is a very specific uh, question. Patrick, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this. The person okay. said that they have na nearly completed their will. Um, the last step is essentially to hand over the information to their lawyer about the charities that they want to include. Um, they have a list already of about a dozen organizations that they care about. Um, what information about these organizations do they need to provide to the lawyer? Or specifically, what information, if they're using the free will platform, what information do they need to be plugging in? Yeah, great question. So really, the name of the organization. And then you really want to add, if you can, the EIN and the legal address of that organization. And, and I believe that both of these will be readily available on Charity Navigator. Um, but let's say... I don't know the exact numbers, but I think there's something like 50,000 Rotary Clubs in America, right? There's 1,100 United Way locals. There are, you know, tens of thousands of things that have dog or cat in the name. And so for folks who are then uh, the executors of the will after you've passed away, you want to make sure it's going to the place you really want. An EIN, an address, is, is the safest way to do that. Um, similarly, um, you know, I, I grew up going to a Roman Catholic church called uh, St. Catherine's Church. Uh, that is one of something like a thousand St. Catherine's Church in the United States and probably one of a hundred thousand in the world. So uh, specificity really helps here and, and EIN and legal, legal address. Um, so EIN, I think, just stands for employee identific employer identification number, but, but each nonprofit will have its own, similar to the way you have your own social security number. Right. So it is unique to every organization. And as Patrick, again, stressing this, there are many, many organizations that have the same name or similar names. And so you can't just go by the name um, alone. It is really important to try to attach with the name the employer identification number. Again, as Patrick says, it works just like a social security number. It's, it's unique. Um, we have about five minutes left. Uh, here is another question, uh, and um, let's see. Um, my, uh, if we, well, I think we've answered this question already, so I can skip over this. Um, I think a question is coming through. Here's here's a question. Please tell me about donor advised funds, pros and cons versus creating a charitable trust. Oh, such a good question. Um, I'll give a very brief overview and then I also know that there, I think there's one more slide that Grace wants to get to, is that right? Um, so donor advised funds, a, they're a good way to uh, get a real time tax deduction for a larger amount to charity. So your, your tax deduction comes immediately and then over time, you can distribute it to the charities uh, that you, you care about and love. Um, donor advised funds also have some form of a beneficiary designation, although it's not quite identical, uh, meaning you can't ever leave that money back to your children, but you can put them in charge of making recommendations in the future. Uh, the big downside of, of, of donor advised funds, also known as DAFs, is that it can slow the process of money getting to charity. Right? Instead of making that gift in December of this year to the charity and have it go right to work, um, it may sit there for a while, you might not think about it, um, and you might make that distribution in two years or five years or farther down the road. Um, so, uh, Grace, I don't know if you want to comment at all on DAPS. Um, no, I, I will say that they have just become extremely popular and are increasing in their popularity, which is um, likely why they're top of mind. Um, and I think that if if you are really dedicated to getting the funds to charities as quickly as possible, it's still a great place for that money to grow um, in the fund while you're dispersing that to your favorite charities. That That is one um, comment I will make. That's great. 
And uh, so we have it for a time, I'll click forward to the next slide. Um, so I know you want to show this. Yeah, I the it would be I would be remiss to not mention that you know we're a charity as well. We do obviously have um, get a lot of benefit from bequests being left to Charity Navigator itself, and so we created a legacy society in recognition of our founders, the Pat and Marion Dugan Legacy Society, um, and that's just our group of individuals who have demonstrated their deep commitment to the world of philanthropy and specifically to what we do, and have left us in their will and an estate plan. Um, so if you leave us in your will or estate plan. You will join this Legacy Society. We've got um, specific outreach that we do to you, certain information, events that you'll be invited to, um, and it will truly help us with the future, with the future planning that we have, with um, ensuring that we've got a long hist a long future ahead of us. Um, you know, we just recognized 20 years, we're recognizing 20 years this year, and we would like to stay around for 20 more. So those in the Pat and Marion Dugan, Dugan Legacy Society are a huge part of us being um, confident in our future. Um, so I did want to just put that little note if you choose to consider us for your will and um, regardless of what charities you include, I know any charity will be extremely lucky to be considered um, and be a part of uh, benefiting from all of the assets that you have. Um, that's my little bit there. Um, and I, we all really appreciate you joining us so much. I will say that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Grace. And Patrick, um, any last comments that you'd like to make uh, before we sign off? We have about two minutes. Sure. I mean, first of all, I'll just say a big thank you to everyone who's joined today. I mean, this is a this is one of the most important topics that people don't talk about enough. And so thank you for taking a moment to really learn, um, you know, down the road, your families, your loved ones, the causes you love will really thank you for being proactive about learning about this. Um, two, I would say, you know, please continue to spread the word about Michael Will Month and the need for estate planning. I mean, this is a huge issue. Uh, it becomes an even more big issue in minority communities where some of the rates of, of will making are even lower. Um, but across the board, we just need to make sure that folks are putting this into place. And that's why so many organizations have teamed up to make, make a Will Month successful. And the third, just a huge thank you to the folks at Charity Navigator. I mean, obviously for putting this on, but, but the, the, uh, unbelievably enormous collective effort over the last 20 years has sort of radically shaped giving and made a lot of people uh, a lot more effective donors and made a lot of great nonprofits a lot more uh, a lot better resource and more effective and so um, you know the whole nonprofit community and frankly the whole country owes a debt of gratitude to Cherry Navigator and so really glad to be partnered with you all here. Thank you so much Patrick and before I jump to Grace I'm gonna we're gonna hang on to you for a second there, Patrick, with a minute. Um, there is a, a question that just sneaked in. Uh, is there like a simple screening uh, device or any type of tool attached to free will that a person can use to determine whether or not free will will work for the individual donor? So I guess they're wondering whether or not there is something that they can actually kind of test to see if it works for them as opposed to going through traditional channels of reaching out to an attorney. Yep, so if you go through the process, uh, there will be a couple of things that you might enter that will trigger a flag and it will say, you know, keep going, make sure you get all your affairs in order, but this is something that means you might wanna go visit an attorney. And so that could be a state size, it could be family complexity, it could be that you own property in, you know, Eastern Romania, things like that. Um, and that it will sort of flag it for you to say, you know, just, just to make sure, keep doing all this because the more complex your thing is, the more important it is that you get things right early, but you're gonna want an attorney's help at the end. And, and there are some tools there also to help you find some folks near you uh, if you don't have anyone in mind. Thank you so much, Patrick. And Grace, any final comments? Just another thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, as has been shared, this is extremely important. Um, and again, another thank you to Patrick and Free Will for um, creating this resource, for educating a lot of us in the nonprofit sector, especially about how to be um, talking to folks about this and for sharing this with all of our donors and with all the folks um, interested in making a will and leaving a legacy um, potentially to their favorite charities. Thank you for joining us. All right, and so with that, we are all done. Um, 
Again, if you are registered for this webinar and you are online, even if you had to jump off, you will receive a recording about 24 hours after we sign off. So thank you very much and have a pleasant day or morning wherever you are in the world. Take care, everyone.